to Humberto Gallegos. I'm the interim chair for CSRC. If you guys don't know this, our friend Brian Bannister had a uh, family personal issue he had to take care of, so he had to step down as chair. And as co-chair, I had to step up and, and keep the ball rolling. And so uh, I'm happy to serve as an interim chair for the CSRC um, committee. Just in case those are not uh, aware of what CSRC is responsible for, and I'm gonna go ahead and read this through the website. <laughs> uh, CSRC is responsible for establishing and maintaining an active state-of-the-art network of GPS control <laughs> uh, for reliable spatial reference system in California. So we're all here to listen to a topic or topics that revolve around this theme. And so we're gonna go ahead and start off with our director, uh, Dr. Bott, to uh, report out on the uh, CSRC's mission. After that, we have a couple of presentations, um, including myself, on our NSF project that deals with the uh, land surveying uh, project that we were able to get funded through NSF. We have our friends here from NOAA, um, folks from uh, industry, professional land surveyors, giving talks on this topic. We have folks, professors from different mm -hmm. Um, academic uh, organizations and our friends from Caltrans as well. So with that, a couple of housekeeping rooms. Uh, restrooms are which way, Rich? This way. Um, let's uh, make sure we put our phones on vibrate mode. Uh, if there's any parking issues, make sure you guys take care of that with our friend Marie. Um, let's see. And if you guys have any, and our friends that are uh, logging in online, if you guys have any questions or um, Request for from presenters or or a, a question for the for the for our guests. Make sure you guys run that through the uh, chat room online through Marie. So with that, I have a round of applause for our program director, Dr. Bach. He's our first speaker for the day. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I see some uh, old acquaintances and some, some new people. I'm going to uh, present uh, a director's report, which is most more going to be uh, um, things that we've been working on. I um, had uh, scripts, different projects that we've been working on. And I'll touch a bit about some of the, the CSRC background, but I think I'm mostly going to concentrate on the work that we're doing. All right, so I'm going to just briefly give you some uh, updates on the California Real-Time Network, certain, um, discuss some work we've been doing on CSRS and how that uh, could fit into the NSRS, a little bit of um, little bit of uh, uh, about machine learning. We've been working on a project and some uh, extreme weather events. So to motivate um, the presentation, so we've all been uh, aware of all the different uh, hazards that we've been experiencing over the last um, few months. Uh, you see that uh, almost everything here we've, uh, experience and that kind of uh, uh, motivates a lot of our uh, work and also uh, the consequences of all these uh, hazards are really complicate our work as surveyors and map makers. Dr. Bach, for a quick technical item, the folks online aren't seeing the presentation. You have an option from the board to share it. To share it. Yes, please. All right. <laughs> okay. This is going to work. We got it. Got it. <laughs> right. That thing on the side, so we can do it. 
I, do you see the background? I saying these different uh, hazards that we we uh, study also complicate our work as conveyors and map makers because um, everything's moving where we live and uh, that complicates the determination estimation of positions So these are different uh, things that we can uh, learn from GPS. Um, highlighted here, some of the work that we've been doing in, here at uh, SIO, um, different aspects of, of GPS. Um, lately, we've been talking about um, working on sea level and, and geoid. And a lot of the focus is going to be on the afternoon, going to be on, on those topics. So we have, we have several good speakers in the afternoon that will be discussing uh, um, geoid and other items related to that. Plus, all of these things require a precise and well defined four dimensional reference frame <clears throat> for spatial awareness. And that really is, is required by everybody public, private, defense, and the uh, academic community. All right, this slide, my usual slide about showing the, the displacements the, the, that really are, um, underlie, um, excuse me, the, uh, the daily displacements that we estimate here on a regular basis. This is a time series of of displacements at a, a site um, on the east side of the uh, Sea, the HLG. And you see that we experience, besides the tectonic motion, we experience all kinds of other phenomena, such as post seismic decay, post seismic offsets, um, and uh, all that. And I'll show you some other, other types of uh, crustal motion. And all, all that complicates our uh, maintenance uh, of the reference frame. Okay, the way we've been doing things up till now is defining epic dates of uh, coordinates. I'll last the epic date is 2017.5. And what we do is we, based on the time series that I showed you of position, <coughs> positions, we compute the coordinates of the stations and their geoidal heights uh, at about uh, 900 stations in, in California. And the coordinates at that epoch basically define um, the reference frame. Essentially, you have um, a uh, we work in the global ICRF system, the XYZ, um, latitude, longitude, and height. That's the references that we work with. Uh, in uh, um, we refer that to um, the NAD eighty three. Um, after transformation from ICRF, we refer to the um, NAD eighty three. The last uh, um, realization of that, or the um, EPIC 2010 was published in 2011. And then using the well known relationships, then we can determine the, um, the orthometric correction that gives us the, the, the elevation of the stations. 
Now this slide was prepared by Greg a while ago. And, and so the system that we've developed is not only the coordinates that, um, that define the, um, the epic data, 2017.5, but it also includes many other pieces of information, different definitions um, here, the uh, ITRF, NAD, the different geodetic models, all these things are used in our processing of the data. We have a, a database of, of uh, data that goes in to the uh, computations in order to get our, our coordinates. Then we have the, the spatial reference network, which is kind of the key, but it's supported by all these other, other items. And of course, then we need um, public outreach in order to make this all this information useful to people like you. And that's really the, the purpose of the CSRC is to provide access to the, the, the CSRM. Um, briefly, uh, regarding to certain, on the left, I'm showing the, um, the stations that are GNSS capable. So we have a pretty good distribution in uh, throughout the state. And the ones on the right are stations that are only broadcasting, um, they're only uh, receiving GPS stations and broadcasting uh, RTCN from those stations. So you see we have pretty good distribution. And then uh, little by little, the stations on the right will be upgraded uh, to full GNSS capability. Now, the problem is for, for certain is right now we're only transmitting the um, GPS data um, plus the um, GLONASS constellation. And we've, we have a prototype, uh, a new methodology and a new system that will then now will broadcast all, all the GNSS satellites. So we're, we're in the process of, of uh, we have a prototype and we're testing that. And, uh, we'll announce that. Uh, fairly soon, and that that will will work the same way that it works now. Um, I think Maria will discuss later some metrics. So we have quite a few users. I think we distributed about twenty eight hundred um, accounts. Um, there's quite a few users now who are, are supporting certain through our consortium, and. Uh, and people who are uh, requesting access to multiple stations. Okay, so this is a little bit complicated, but I'll go through this. So here are the certain stations which I mentioned. And what, uh, with the new system, um, well, we're going to maintain the old system, but what we would like to um, to promote, and we'll have this capability, is instead of broadcasting the 2017.5 coordinates, we would then broadcast new update coordinates of the rebels. So that would take a little bit of conversation and um, modification, but essentially within the framework, we should be able to do that. And that's the way we built the new system. Uh, and what the way we work there is, and we, you're familiar with the, the sector um, application on the website that allows you to determine coordinates of any of our reference stations anytime. And so this is going, this now we have a real time sector which will then feed um, the RTCM that we receive, that you're receiving from the certain stations. It will then seed it with using this real-time sector, it will then seed it with new update coordinates. Um, there's, a, there's an aggregator in the middle, don't worry about that. And then uh, also in the background is our skip utility, our dynamic data utility, which I'll describe a, a bit. And so in real time, the, um, we're getting the stations are coming into our, um, our server, then we then make it available to to you. Um, currently, the users send us a their approximate positions. Uh, in the future, we'd like also have a way of, of 
eight of the, co of the coordinates that you would like to see. Rather than take the true of date coordinates and move them to any epoch that you would like. And that's the date correction. And so in the background, we have a sector and a skip. Then we'll then provide the, the user with, with their data um, and the correction in order to move from one date to another. So there is a, um, a, a way of doing that through the um, through entry protocol. So it's really just a matter of, of reading, of having the, uh, the data collectors able to read that information through a, a recognized form. Okay, so what, what we've developed uh, is uh, the dynamic data. And we're kind of promoting this for kind of transition into the, the NSRS and we've been in contact with NGS and uh, seeing if that's something that they would be interested in. And so we're calling it, they've always called this intraframe velocity model. That's what they call this addition to the NSRS for people who are in areas of of crustal deformation that, that need, need to be taken into consideration. And so what we, we do there is we create these, these grids, <laughs> these grids of displacements where we um, combine a geophysical model, which gives us the um, kind of, um, a starting point for the velocities. And then we add to that deviations from from linear motion, that is from nonlinear motions, we combine that and we have a grid that includes both of those types of motions. And so we, we end up with is uh, a weekly displacement grid. That means we every every week we create a new uh, a new grid of displacements. And this one happens to be the, on April 15th. The grid at the, um, the, the situation on on the ground on, on, on that date, and we have the east, east, north, and up um, components and their their uh, misfits. Um, so you'll notice here we see the motion of the, the transition from um, the North American plate across the, the very wide boundary. Up to the Pacific plates, you see the transition to the San Andreas fault motion in both the north and east component. And in the up component, we see, um, which is kind of saturated here, but we see the subsidence in the uh, center of San Joaquin Valley in the Sacramento Valley. And those are then updated once a week. And so the, the architecture that I showed you in the previous slide extracts the, the, the grid for the, the um, basically uh, extract information that allows you to go from, from this basically true of date back to any particular epic by having a correction between the grid today and, and the grid some, somewhere in the past. And we have this uh, um, application, the skip application, which allows you to, to do that in a uh, post-processing mode, but that will be then um, with the upgrade to, to certain that will, you can do that as well as in, in real time. And this is just the outcome of the go through this. All right, now what we've been doing is in order to improve the, the spatial resolution of the grids, we combine the, the GPS displacement or the you know, displacements that we get from the GPS or GNSS, and that provides a reference frame for, for interferometric synthetic aperture radar, which you see on the right is satellites that repeatedly pass over an area and then can see changes in the, in the ground uh, motion. Uh, and so combining that, um, you get a three-dimensional picture of what's happening on the surface. Uh, and by looking at the grids from, you know, 
the, the sequence of grids, then you see how how the um, how that's how the deformation is is changing in time. And that'll give some examples of the MSAR uh, GNSS integration. Um, this is something that's showing the um, the different phases of the earthquake cycle. So here you have the velocities. Um, these are the um, displacements during an earthquake, the co-seismic displacement. And this is a, a map of the co-seismic motion that occur. So by integrating the two systems, you can uh, identify these features and um, get a higher spatial resolution for, for the grid. Here's an example of subsidence in the um, southern, southern part of the San Joaquin Valley. And that's a, a bit more complicated. We don't use an underlying model for the vertical motion. Rather, we, we just um, fit the data that, that's observed. Here you see, for example, the time series in the vertical component, which shows a, a subsidence and then a change in slope. That's due to a uh, period of drought where more water is extracted from the ground. And then a uh, period of rain where the subsidence lessens or the course continues. And here's a, just a, a map of the uh, you know, different subsidence rate at these different stations. So when you go into the dynamic data, then it will tell you how much motion occurred between one epic uh, to another. Okay, so what we've been proposing to, to uh, NGS, and we hope we'll get, it'll, it'll happen, is to integrate this, um, this concept of the, this um, application into their intraframe, what they call the intraframe velocity model, which we're calling intraframe velocity and transient model. And so that will fit in these the different boxes or the, just the different components, but it, it, we're proposing that it fits into their existing applications, which is they use this page of software for positioning, just like we do for our work. And they have the opus, um, everybody's familiar with that. And with this could be, um, an upgrade to Opus, or it could be another standalone application. So we've had several discussions with them, and they're they're quite interested. Um, the, the negative part is that they're, um, um, they don't want to complicate the the rollout of SRS, mm -hmm. which has already been delayed. I don't know how many years. So there's a faction that doesn't want to change the, the MSRS at this point, and that some people want to change it because when they when they roll it out, we still have the same problem that we have today with the NAD3. So you have this crustal deformation going on, and they really haven't given you the tools in order to take that into account. They do have a they have a, a program HTTP, which is uh, a um, provides you. Um, changes in in, uh, in coordinates. It's not it is as timely, and it also doesn't really deal with the transient motions that occur on an ongoing basis, which can be significant. Okay, I want to switch now to um, something that we've been uh, working on here at, at Scripps. This is a um, part of a proposal that we just sent to. Um, to NGS, stay, stay there. And here you have just the um, kind of the traditional reference frame um, components where you have an ellipsoid and a geoid and you determined um, the um, separation between the two. Um, currently we have NAD3 and NAVD88, which provides you the um, the height, the geoidal height, and that's based on basically leveling, leveling across the U.S., and it's tied 
to a single tide gate on the on the Great Lakes. And so that's the basis of their NADE88. And the NADA3 is, is what it is for the terrestrial reference frame. Um, so now with the rollout of NSRS, they're going to replace the, the vertical component will, will be replaced by a, a geopotential model, which they've got they've um, um, they've um, realized through uh, airborne gravity measurements, and in uh, combining those two with the geopotential for the vertical motion, corrected for vertical motion on land, those provide you the, the reference frame to the NSRS. But it's more, it's more complicated than that because the assumption here is that the, the land geoid is, is consistent with the, the marine geoid. And we don't, and the way it's defined now, that's basically just an assumption. And so what we're trying to do then is to, to merge the two, the marine geoid with the terrestrial geoid. And this here shows the different surfaces and the complications that are inherent in that problem. And essentially the problem is this, what we call the, um, the, dynamic, the, the dynamic ocean topography or the, the DOT. And that is this, this actual, the actual topography, topography of the ocean. And that was what, what complicated the NAD D88 because they had these tide gauges on the coast that were supposed to be the tie with the mar marine geoid, but those were not very re reliable. That was so, a problem with 29, right? In the NAD D88. And so they weren't very, they really didn't have the connection between the, the terrestrial geoid and, and the marine geoid because the, the tide gauges were not were not sufficient. So therefore you had some kind of like you had a tilt of the, the vertical reference frame and something like a 50 centimeter deviation once you got to the west, the west coast. So what we're trying to do is to, to unify the, the reference frames where you have um, the four dimensional frame on, on, the, on the earth's surface on, on, the, on the ground and you have the inter interface with the, the ocean so that in the coastal environment, then you have this, this, this seamless uh, transition from, the, you basically have a, a geoid that transitions from the, um, from the land to the, to the sea. And that of course has been complicated by this, this sea surface topography. So we've brought to bear several uh, systems uh, in order to do this, uh, this unification, what we call. And so we have altimeters, um, airborne gravity with, with new types of sensors. Of course, we have the GNSS. We have wave gliders. Um, we have what's called GNSS IR, which is basically turning the GPS into tide gauge, uh, and we have ocean bottom sensors. And those are intended then to provide data in order to do this merging of the data. Um, so we're proposing this project area, this square. Here are the existing GPS stations on land. Um, we also want to install you know, five of these um, GNSS tide gauges um, and do um, and survey this, this particular area as a, as a demonstration. And so what we're trying to do is, let me just uh, kind of outline it here, is to develop uh, the, the sub, what I call supplementary NSRS model on the centimeter level through these gridding, this gridding process in our regions of significant ground motions. That is using the INSAR and GNSS that I described, um, the same stations that make up the, the California um, reference network that goes into the CSRS. 
And then, as I mentioned here the, just now, they develop and demonstrate a methodology to better connect the offshore and onshore bird datums <laughs> at around the centimeter level with improved spatial re um, resolution. And so we're developing this methodology and what we would like from, from this, this audience is to be able to test it, to test these different components um, through our CSRC community, which we know includes you know, a whole range of, of users. And so once we get to the point where we can, just like we've, we've developed a skip utility that could be used um, by the community, then we want to do the same thing with these other applications that have, that have more to do with the, the heights, the orthometric height. So in order to do that, we have several types of that, uh, applications. And you know that the, the geoid today is, is basically determined through satellite altimetry. Um, but um, that's, again, there's a, um, there's a transition on, on the coast between the, um, the altimetry observations and the near coast. So you have a, a, a different um, um, phenomena like uh, winds, strong, most, strong, uh, strong, uh, strong surges, currents, and then ra radar reflections from the shore with the altimeter that you can't really um, the resolution of the altimeter near near coast is not is not well uh, well observed. So you need to take into account what's happening in the transition from from the land to the sea. And so there's several things that we want to do. One thing is to deploy these wave gliders, and those are basically autonomous vehicles that are uh, propelled by wave motion. Each one has a, a two GNSF antennas and not IMU. And uh, the idea is to basically clarify the wave motion near, near the coast. And we do this like 10 kilometers from the coast. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, also use the tide gauges, which provide us, um, not the tide gauges, the ocean bottom, pressure sensors, which record variations of, of downward pressure at the seabed, which is then proportional to variations in sea level. So that also gives you some uh, a way of seeing the actual motions of the, of the waves and also the tidal component that will then allow you to, to better refine the, um, the transition of the geoid at, um, at the, the intersection of with the land geoid. The next one is this GNSS IR. Dr. Bach, you pause the presentation. Hit the play button, the green triangle. Bottom to the right. If the green triangle is yeah, yeah, the green triangle. There you go. Ah, there's no Okay. Okay. So the GNSSIR is a supplementary um, set of observations that basically provide you a, a good set of, of um, sea, sea level measurements over time. And that's, uh, that'll assist with linking the land and ocean vertical reference frame in the presence of these different phenomena. And we have, you may know we have a uh, an open sea tide gauge on at the end of the SIO pier, which has been observing for I don't know, 100 years or so. The next um, technology we're going to use is airborne gravity uh, measurements, which is really the basis of the, any, the, the new um, NSRS through this, um, this GRAV-D program that NGS flew these airborne gravity missions. 
And what we want to do is, is to, um, to evaluate a new system called a navigation Doppler LIDAR system that provides millimeter per second precision in, uh, um, with a, uh, an IMU as a gravity sensor. And we're hoping with that, that we can get a, um, a, um, a higher precision um, um, gravity measurement that would then um, reduce the, the, the uncertainties and the location of the field. And you'll, you'll hear this in the afternoon, we have three speakers. One is going to talk about sea level variations. And the other one is going to talk about geoid modeling. And uh, third talk will be on sea floor operations. So to kind of tie these, these ideas together. And so the final step is to create this geoid model. And that we solve for a marine geoid, which is subject to an ocean model and the observational the observations that we've taken that I mentioned. And uh, as part of that, we will part of the model will then um, constrain the continuity with uh, the marine geoid with the terrestrial geoid. Um, and so that will provide you a, a geoid correction to the essentially to the, the NSRS geopotential. So you'll, you'll be able to then um, supplement that um, with this model, which will then give you this transition that will unify the, the geoid across the, the land sea boundary. And this is from a paper by one of the speakers this afternoon, Matthew Maslow. And he, in the past, he's, um, um, modeled a correction field to another geoid model. So using the same approach, you would then apply it to the, um, the, the NSRS vertical uh, reference. Okay. How much time do I have left? You have uh, 13, 12 minutes. Yeah, okay. So in order to do that, you know, uh, if this requires a, um, the basic geodetic knowledge in order to take all these pieces and together and be able to do something like this. And so what we're in the process of doing is, you know, we have a lot of researchers here and in fact, um, instructors, uh, faculty that teach different courses and then what they're, they're, they're different different areas that are that are more geared to, to, to geophysics and we're a geophysics department. But we, what we want to do is take this, this expertise and add a, a new few new courses and then develop a, um, a geodesy program that will be visible as, as a geodesy program. You hear that, Peter? <laughs> I heard it. <laughs> Excuse me. So that's the um, that's kind of our, our goal. You know what is to do this collectively and then have SIO to be recognized as a place where you go and study geodesy rather than going geophysics and uh, um, we're doing some some research in machine learning. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go into that in detail, but what we're doing is we're trying to make it um, more uh, efficient to determine transients in, in geodetic observation. And so we're developing uh, machine learning uh, techniques in order to do that. For example, this is, uh, at the, we have a, a large database of these transients, um, artifacts and things. And so we have a knowledge base that we can draw from in order to develop something that, that can be done with a machine learning application. 
you know, for example, here we have differences looking at individual stations over time. We can identify, um, this is a comparison of GNSS and INSAR. And so you see many stations go um, track very well between the two, and there's a handful of stations that don't track very well. So we need to kind of teach, teach these algorithms how to be able to use that information and to um, distinguish between a, a, a good station versus a station that's not up to speed. We're doing that also with uh, atmospheric rivers and extreme weather events. Um, as we know, we've experienced many atmospheric rivers this, uh, this past uh, season. And what this is trying to do is, this is a plot of how the different stations and looking at the delay in the troposphere delay as it um, travels from the satellite to the ground, we, we measure the delay in the signal. And from that, we, we track that. And you can see here that um, this is several stations. So over, over time, you see that you can have these peaks that um, represent um, the, the, the high the large troposphere delay, which then gives us the, the peak um, of that atmospheric river or extreme weather event. And we have a database of that, of different um, atmospheric rivers, and we also have a time series of the troposphere delay at the five minute resolution over about 20, 20 years. So it gives us a training data set in order to use. And here's another a record of these different AR events. So you see these peaks. This is again the this happens to be the water, integrated water vapor, um, which is a function of the troposphere delay. And you see these peaks that, that line up with these different atmospheric river events. And even then, you also have peaks on other types of extreme weather events, things like summer monsoon events and other storm events that occur over, over time. So using that, that uh, technology, we can then um, track these weather events and turn that into um, basically flood warning. That's used by the uh, National Weather Service uh, offices that we work with in uh, in Oxnard and in San Diego. Okay, there's another um, item that we're looking at is what's called cluster analysis. And that basically looks at a bunch of stations and the, the residuals from our fit to the data. You saw a daily time series and we fit a model through that. And then looking at, at the, the whole um, network, this is all the stations that we're looking at. You perform this cluster analysis, which then allows you to pick out um, features. And for example, uh, the second cluster points to these different stations here, and those line up with the uh, subsidence in the Central Valley. So by doing this cluster analysis, you can then identify um, different phenomena that occur over the area that, that's being monitored. That's uh, basically all. Thank you for your attention and any questions. Um, if we're at the agency looking for like, we wanted to see like, you know, um, areas that are like really bad subsidence, would we use, would it be useful to use? So like where it has the, um, the color colorizations or is there that, that again? I mean, so like if we're looking for subsidence in an area, like right. yeah. would uh would it be possible to use a skip tool to see like um, problem areas or is there a better would it be a better yeah area? I mean you can yeah you can put problem areas as far as like yeah, yeah. Like like a lot, lot of motion. Yes, yes, yeah, subsidence. 
Yeah, so it's a, we track it on a weekly basis through mm -hmm. these grids. And so you can follow the, the grid to a different position at a, a, loca a particular location and then track all of the, um, the areas of sighting. That, that, but the more stations you have, the better the gridding, especially in areas of subsidence. And now that the Department of Water Resources is, is putting in more stations in, in that area in order to uh, improve the resolution. But yeah, that could be just uh, integrated into SCIP. And, and that, that would allow you then to determine subsidence at any, any point within a, a particular area. Really yeah, depends on the space. Yeah, would we have to be positioned to the skip to really get a good uh, idea of what areas are subsiding? Or yeah, you would see how the, the ground is subsiding over time. There's, there's a graphical one. Yeah, there's, the, the, color scheme, can... the color schemes are derived from inside grid. Oh, the color scheme? The, um, the up part and skip from the, the graphical map is an integration of the mm -hmm. continuous sites mm -hmm. and yeah, so, you can yeah, so, so you have this, you yeah. saw this blob in the San Joaquin Valley and Sacramento Valley. It's kind of saturated because it's, uh, it's so much larger than subsidence in other areas. Yeah. But there are subsidence, for example, in, in the Santa Ana Basin, in, in different places um, around the state. You can window out the time frame that you want to look at. Then you can export it. Uh, database file, CSV file. Mm -hmm. yeah. How often is this sort of the weekly grids get the weekly SR for portions of the entire area? Or how do you that? Good question. Uh, the repeat cycle of the current inside satellite is about what, 12 days. So we, we do the um, integration over something like a month. So we have this uh, the monthly. And then the, the inside is not good everywhere. Sometimes there is in areas, uh, agricultural areas, where you have crop growing, and that will throw off the, the inside because you're looking for the ground all the time. There are areas where, that are not well covered. Or are not well determined. But if you go further north, like in Stadia area, well, then it's difficult to do inside. And there we rely on the um, GNSS. But in California, we have a map now, of, uh, an integrated map going up to the heading right up to the Bay Area. Question. Yeah, as a pragmatic usage for predicting these extreme weather events and, uh, you know, peaks and valleys, these atmospheric rivers that come through, is it your hope or to aid FEMA and our other agencies in uh, mobilizing forces to, you know, offset problems? Well, the, the main thing that we've been working on is using this information for flood forecasts. And so that would then, the, the weather service provides that information. And that would then um, filter down to emergency services and area warnings of particular areas that would experience flooding. Is that what you're, you're yeah, asking? Correct. I mean, that, yeah. that would be the, me the pragmatic yeah, um, reason to do this rather than, right. you know, Theoretical or right. you know, that's exactly what I was trying to convey. Is that this this work is, is that we're doing is funded through through a NASA project. And it's working in collaboration with uh, um, the National Weather Service Station um, so offices in here in San Diego and in the LA area. So there's two offices that we're working with, and they've already uh, based on on our on information. They've already uh, issued a flood warning based on that information, which was pretty accurate. Okay. What they want to know is the area that's that's affected, 
and they want to know how fast and what is the, it's, yeah, they want to know how fast it's moving and and also how much um how much um um rain and that rain how much um the water vapor in the air how that's going to uh, migrate over the area so they want to know its speed and and how, how far it will migrate right now that excuse me right now they're using weather they're using models the center here at scripps that just concentrates on atmospheric rivers and they're uh, producing models of the movement of the atmospheric river over the ocean and those sometimes are, are good and sometimes are, are less good. So this information on the land is supplemented to that. Okay. So, uh, Steve? So what I heard several years ago is that they could get something like a 45 minute prediction of an extreme weather event out of that. Is it still in the ballpark? Hmm. Well, what's the time frame? 45 minutes prediction of an extreme weather event. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a reasonable, that's reasonable. It's a lot more than an earthquake. Early, yeah. <laughs> early in the morning, <laughs> that's for sure. But yeah, I, I mean, some hours, several hours would be sufficient. But it would be, it would be a fairly, uh, yeah, fairly short. Dr. Bach, less of a question, more of a comment, uh, the use of AI to analyze those data sets just mm -hmm. sounds like an incredible future tool. I mean, you don't have the personnel to look at every station and see how it's operating it's and look for anomalies. And here it is, unsupervised analysis. I like that term. It's kind of a <laughs> gentle term for AI. <laughs> it's not, you know, and I, I heard a really good quote. It's like, you know, AI is not coming for your job, but people who know AI are coming for your job. <laughs> well, I can't say that I know AI. But you know, we're working with AI experts up there, and up till now we haven't had we haven't gotten the greatest results yet. But I've spent I've spent a lot of time looking at the data and doing things visually, um, and it's it's tedious. And so we're hoping we have several groups that are working to try to to automate that and improve the process. Brilliant. And there's two there's two uh, methodologies there, but unsupervised. Where you don't use any other information, and then supervised is you use a training data that, um, for example, all the artifacts and all the cool seismic offsets that we um, determine. We're not we got a database of those, and then we use that as a training data set, and that's called a supervised. Okay, very cool. Any other questions? And questions from the chat. Do you have any chat questions? Yeah, good question. There was a hand raised. Um, no question has been presented. All right, we'll uh, see if they can type it. We'll get the question answered. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Okay, next we're going to hear from uh, Professor Umberto Gallegos uh, on filling skill gaps through the Geospatial Engineering and Technologies Program at East Los Angeles College. Professor Gallego seeks to enhance the number of community college students and secondary school students to pursue a career in academic in, uh, pathways in land surveying and geospatial engineering and technology fields, including civil engineering. He seeks ways to continue to work with the community of practice, both licensees and research and development groups in land surveying and advanced forms of geospatial engineering and technology projects. Thank you, Rich. And what he just said took a lot of effort and time for me to even make a dent. It has been quite the experience to be able to work with community college students. Give me one minute to see if I can get my screen to share. Is it um is it doing its thing? Um, you have to accept. accept. Just one second. You, okay. you, um, let me let me ask you again to join as a parent. Gotcha. Thank you. There we go. Okay. And then if you could, you know what? I exited. That. Yes. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you so much. Gotcha. Okay. So um, so let me introduce to you guys and gals the uh, community college. So we have this cool um, marketing video that I like to promote. 
uh, with our um, students. It's a video that was um, put together through the help of Regina Blasberg. I don't know if you guys know Regina from College of the Canyon. Regina and I used to work at the Corps of Engineers. In fact, her husband and I were part of the same band. The name of the band was Stinky Twinky. <laughs> and um, so both uh, Regina and her husband and I were um, colleagues at the Corps of Engineers after I met my wife. Um, after that, we dispersed. Um, I went to go work for Tesla Tech. Uh, Regina took on a job at East LA College, and then she ended up taking up the uh, chair position at College of the Canyons. Her husband ended up going into the private sector. Um, after Tetra Tech, I went back to UCI. I uh, wanted to focus on water resources, so the uh, correlation between the uh, signal and the ARs was uh, something I'm actually interested in learning more about. So my passion is in both water resources and land surveying. So while working for ELAG, Regina asked me, hey, Humberto, I got some funds. I can put a marketing video together for you. And I'm like, yeah, for sure. And so with that, let me show you our marketing video. And Humberto, you may need to share it to the Zoom meeting. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's see. Uh -huh. I think I know how to do this. There it is. Right there. Yes, sir. There with sound. So the sound is not good, no worries, the video tells it all. Mm -hmm. Geospatial engineering, land surveying. According to the California Land Surveyors Association, a large percentage of professional land surveyors will be retiring in just the next few years. While the number of applicants registered for the professional land surveyors and fundamentals of surveyors state examinations is low, the demand by business and local governments for professional land surveyors with these skill sets is high. Surveyors make precise measurements to determine property boundaries. They provide data relevant to the shape and contour of the Earth's surface for engineering, map making, construction projects, and legal disputes. An additional branch in the profession is geospatial engineering. Geospatial engineers use new and developing technologies such as GPS, satellite imagery, laser mapping, and fast computing to create complex layers of interconnected geographic information. All of this means you get to exercise your mind through the use of math and science while exercising your body by being out in the field using precision gear. You're never stuck in the office. There's always different scenery. You're never going to survey the same area more than a couple months. You're also helping to improve your city and your community around you. Some of the issues and challenges that the land surveyors face is the lack of people doing land surveying. So how do you get into a career with such solid demand and excellent pay? Take some math, drafting, and surveying courses, and then pass the Fundamentals of Surveyors exam hosted by the state of California. Two career pathways for a high school student or adult learner are available in the heart of Los Angeles, the Geospatial Engineering and Technologies Program at East Los Angeles College and the Geospatial Engineering Program at Cal Poly Pomona. Having an understanding of the field serves other professions, such as photogrammetrist, mapping technicians, and drafters. In this program, you'll never have a dull moment. There are so many different uh, possibilities once you get involved. When you graduate from the geospatial engineering option, you'll be getting the educational credit for engineering, which you can become, still become a civil engineer, while also another opportunity that opened the door for you to become a licensed land surveyor. This is a, definitely a program for students who are in a community college or even coming out of high school who wish to engage in something, to build something, to make something. If you like to get dirty, you like to use advanced equipment, if you like to learn about a specific career type that's in demand, that actually compensates you well, then join this program. So, um, oops, let me uh, mute the speaker. So um, this, this whole program took a whole family of uh, believers to get the program launched. It's not like I did this on my own. 
In fact, the uh, person in charge of the program, Vince Moretti, rest in peace, Vince, he was an RCE. And so his daughter, you probably know his daughter, she's Ivory from uh, WWF. And if you guys Google her, she's one of the glow wrestlers back in the days. But anyways, he was instrumental in me getting to know the program. I had a chance to network with our friends from Santiago Canyon College, College of the Canyons. We put, we put our program together and we launched it. Now, in order to launch a, a program in surveying, you need two things. You need bodies, you need people that can teach these courses, and then you need money. You can pay these individuals. So what we did is we, we um, completed a, a proposal. We submitted to NSF. We got rejected about a million times, and he finally got one after 10 years. And so it takes a while to grab these uh, federal grant projects because they're competitive. It's not like they just award them to anybody. And so we're able to, to win one, and you'll be surprised how fast half a million dollars can, can be spent on something like launching a program. And so let me show you the quick presentation I put together for this program, or for the grant, I should say. All right. So we have a couple of our goals for the uh, project. Let me just um, slide right into those goals. Can you guys see the slide? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so the first one was to assist land surveying and geospatial engineering technicians to pass the exam. We all know that there's a, a demand in California, maybe in different states around the U.S. for more licensees in, in land surveying. So I'm trying to push out folks to take the FS and to take the LS exam, including myself. Can't seem to pass that national PS exam. I'll be heading to my fourth try in trying to pass that exam. The second goal was to offer you know, some cool practical projects in land surveying. Oops, it stopped sharing. Oh, I'm so sorry. How's that? Now I've got the um, presenter view. Gotcha. How's that? Yep, got it. Okay, got it. Um, so offer a few some cool practical projects. So how do we do this? We try to purchase state-of-the-art equipment, 3D scanners, robotic total stations, data collectors. But then we need to hire somebody who knows how to use these things. <laughs> so that has been a challenge for our program. And then the third thing, third thing was to actually help our students land jobs. So I have a couple of cool pictures I'm going to show you down the road of my presentation. We actually had success in landing students some either um, opportunities where they're getting paid for their services or some pro bono or volunteer work for, for, uh, for these land surveying agencies. So in, in an NSF project, you need to go ahead and be a little bit more detailed on what do you try to do in terms of trying to add a, a, uh, a rubric to how many folks you predict you're gonna be helping. And just to be able to help 100 land surveying students in three years was a miracle. And the reason why is because it takes a lot of coordination. Um, and so you bring 100 land surveying students into ELEC and then you need to feed them and then you need to set up a program and you need to get your guest speakers and then buy the uh, swag, the attire that we want to purchase through your federal tax dollars so we can make them feel welcome. And that was a miracle, but we actually had the event take place a couple of years ago, um, pre-COVID, and we had the help from different agencies, DWP, LA County, uh, CLSA, um, even some schools came by from Oregon State to help the cause. In terms of graduating students from our geospatial program at, e at a community college, we work with certificates. We don't do a uh, bachelor's of science. You probably all know this by now. So we work with certificates and they're short-term certificates we call skill sets, certificate achievements, which take about a year to complete then the AS degree. So most of our students complete the skill set certificate because they're fast. You can get out with a quick certificate. Do employees need that? Probably don't. But as long as you are motivated to want to learn, you always reap the benefits of becoming a little bit smarter, especially if you take on land surveying courses or a GIS class or a CAD class. So even though they get the certificate, the important thing is the skill set. And some people want to see a certificate on their resume. Um, the transferring part has been tough. We don't transfer too many students in a uh, Bachelor of Science program, but we do work with them. We do have uh, pathways to Fresno State's uh, Bachelor of Science program. We do have one with Cal Poly Pomona. We also have one with Oregon Institute of Technologies. 
And that has been great because now we have a pathway for those that want to seek more mm -hmm. wealth of knowledge in land surveys. That geospatial, we have that pathway set up at, at ELAC. And so those are interested in some of the projects that you'll be hearing today. There's a pathway for them to seek that type of knowledge. So at a community college, you, you determine where you want to go. If you want to start making a good salary right away, then do land survey because they pay well if you work for the right agency. If you're interested in learning more about geospatial, then take on that Pomona Fresno State OIT pathway and get your Bachelor of Science in, in land surveying. And we have those pathways set up at ELAC. Uh, the cool thing about this project is that we're able to work with Archway Systems. Archway Systems is a vendor that supplies Bentley products. Those that are familiar with open roads or context captured or concept station. The, those tools are being provided through Bentley. Bentley used to be the uh, makers of um, um, inroads for those that are interested in terrain modeling. So inroads is no longer the the, uh, the name. We have open roads or concept station that has taken over th that type of uh, skill set or, or software name. So now we're we paired up with Archway System. We pushed out these cool skill sets. The bad thing is that it's hard to transfer the program to 80 laptops and then make sure that the program is working for each individual student. So that has been a challenge for us to be able to teach students mm -hmm. how to use some terrain modeling like, like uh, concept station or open roads. Um, the pathways for careers has been awesome, but you gotta network with people. So for the city of LA, there's this one gal, her name is Rosie Chin. I'm not sure if anybody knows Rosie, but Rosie was instrumental in landing some jobs for our students for the city of LA, Steve Hennessy opened up a volunteers program for LA County Department of Public Works. We have students volunteering to the LA County. John Tosto, which is volunteers, it's time to stop by ELAC and, and talk about the opportunities at DWP that are coming up. And then Ray Lombetta and Associates. Ray has opened up his doors for students that can land jobs for public agencies, but work for the private sector. So we've been blessed to be able to work with people, but if you wanna help people land jobs, you gotta be able to network with individuals. And there's only one me, so I'm always trying to find people that can help me help our students network. Uh, in an NSF project, you always have to add the intellectual merit to the project. Why, why, should, we hire, why should we choose your project? What, what makes your project so smart? And so the way I make my project so smart is by networking with smart people. And so I've had a chance to work with people like at Cal Poly Pomona, Dr. Mora, have him come in and talk about some of the photogrammetry projects that he's doing with, with his students. Uh, we had John Tosto stop by and do a little bit of a workshop on the stuff that he's doing for, for the agency that he's working for. So I'm always trying to find people that can advance the skill set, not myself, <laughs> not me, but other people that can help us to become smarter and earn some cool skill sets. Um, NSF is also looking for the broader impact. So how can we make our project impact the world? And so when COVID hit, it opened up Zoom sessions. And so we had students taking our online prep course for the FS exam all the way from the Northeast corners of the US. And so that was like the best time to ask NSF for more money because we actually hit a jackpot. We can offer FS prep courses online and they reach the whole world. And the FS is a national exam provided by NCs. It's the first step you need to take on to be able to be eligible for the license exam in land surveying. So even during COVID times, we're able to think of cool ways to make our project uh, have a broader impact in our country. So let me show you the, um, the uh, program real quick at East. So let me show you a quick brochure. Share screen. Even creating this flyer takes time. <laughs> even creating a flyer takes time. So let me go ahead and, is it, can you guys see the flyer? Only on the online, not here. Um, let's see. How's that? Just online. It's online, but not on the screen. It's online, but not on the screen. Oh, that's. Let me stop sharing. And. How's that? Uh, online. Same. Forget it. Just online. Still online. Um, what did I do wrong? Are you tasking your monitor? Or? Share screen. Um, Try uh, your 
can drag it over. Yeah. You drag it over. The projector is your other monitor, I think, right now. The projector is acting as a Gotcha. Um, How's that? Good. All right. Cool. All right. So a couple of cool things about our program is, um, you know, having that water resources background, I love to do some beach surveys with our students. So in the flyer to promote our program, we do a little bit of uh, different things that might not be traditional in a land surveying um, career. We do beach surveys, we do water surveys, and then we link the, uh, the hydraulics portion or the coastal hydraulics portion of our of our project to, to the land surveying data that they're collecting. So that has been fun to be able to create a hybrid um, program at, at ELEC. Um, we do have our courses articulated to different programs. So these are the schools that we're working with, uh, Cal State LA, Cal Poly Pomona and Fresno State. And so this would have to be revisited because each year, or every two or three years, the CSUs go through a facelift. They start changing their course numbers and they start changing courses from 300 to 200 or from 3,000 to 2,000. So we got to work with them constantly to make sure our courses are articulated correctly. So that has been a challenge to be able to work with our professors at the transfer school. But we offer a lot of courses if you're interested in doing a Bachelor of Science in Surveying. In fact, it's probably safe to say that at East, we probably have the most engineering courses that transfer over into a school like Fresno State or Pomona because we have calculus-based courses uh, at the lower divisions. So courses like strength, strength of materials, dynamics, materials of engineering, statics, engineering economics, serving one, serving two, those courses are, are sweet because not a lot of programs have all that wealth of courses to be offered, and that's because they don't have enough hours to offer all these courses, or the instructors that can teach the classes. Um, so the next page. So we do have alumni, that's Carlos Lopez. He's no longer working for the city. He retired. He would always come in and, and talk about how great is, is it to work for the city of LA. And then he would always tell them, don't you guys want to know how much I make? And it's always six figures. And I'm like, Carlos, it's not, it's not about the money. The money's definitely top five or top three, but it's about having passion or a love for your field. And so you always kept bringing up the money issue, but now he's a retiree. These are the courses that we have for our program. And if you notice the uh, flood and coastal mapping courses, those courses were put together because of me, because I have that water background. So we, I tried to create a course where we can teach some of the federal government programs like HEC RAS, those that are familiar with, with flood mapping. I'm not sure if FEMA is using HEC RAS, but I wanted to, to show that at the, uh, at the community college level and offer them that type of skill set. But those courses have not launched. Those are the, the courses that have launched to date. This one has been my favorite, business practices. And I sent out an email to all these entrepreneurs and they gave me feedback and how, how are they running their business? And then things like integrity, a hard work ethic, knowing what you're doing, quality work, and that's what I pushed out for this class. So this has been an exciting class for me because it involved the soft skills. And so of all the survey courses, that has been my favorite because it involves writing. It involves writing. And so, but again, I was able to network with, with people in industry to tell me how are they running their, their, their businesses. Um, let me show you a couple of highlights. Let's see if I can um, make this thing work. How much time do I have, Rich? Oh, let's see, 11.5, 7 minutes. Got it. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me start off here. This is one of our um, students that took our FS prep course. Um, he sent me this picture when he was at the Cal Poly Pomona uh, conference, and he told me, hey, I'm going to your students. He also uh, took the uh, PS review course online with us. He actually worked for LA County Sanitation. Uh, this is our other student, Hugo. He just landed a job just this year. So after 10 years of just navigating through the uh, workforce, he finally landed his land surveying job and he took a picture of himself while he was out in the field. Uh, oops. oops, I got the wrong set of students here. Um, these are my Cal Baptist students. 
Um, sorry. They're way out here. So he, here's one of our networking events. So Steve Hennessy is somewhere in there. There he is. <laughs> so again, um, how do I help the students land jobs? You got to network with people. We all know networking is priceless. So this is at Shakey's by East LA College. I'm always inviting CLSA LA to come over and network with the students because number one, it's free, free food. And number two, the students benefit from just listening to, to these practitioners. So this is our advanced land surveying class. And we have Steve just talking to all the students. He, he actually took the time to talk to the whole group in cohorts, right? He started off over here, then over here, and then over here. So Steve has been a great supporter of our program. This is one of our networking events. Um, here's Alan Ng. This is Alan and I at the ASCE UESI conference, the Utility Engineer Survey Institute um, organization through ASCE. So again, just networking with the best. <laughs> Alan Ng has been instrumental because this guy knows his building information modeling. If you guys have seen some of the uh, skill sets that he's teaching his Cal Poly Pomona students, it's just amazing when he combines 3D scanning and then he uses programs like Revit to create that, that 3D movie going through the building. Just an amazing skill set. I know it's all heading in that direction. At this conference, he also showed me how he was able to teach his Cal Poly Pomona students how to use VR glasses to set up a, a tripod and a, and a gun. And so I thought that was like the coolest thing. So Alan Ng is my, my expert when it comes to that type of skill set. So I enjoyed networking with him. And I saw him and the student at the ASCE. There's gonna be a common theme for the next few pictures. There's food always involved in my meetings. This is Juan Rodas and um, Brandon Royce. So this is after serving out at ELAC. So one of the best things about being able to lead a geospatial program is getting to know your students. And I think this happens a lot at the community college. They say that there's a lot of TLC going on at a CC as compared to the transfer schools uh, or universities. Not that there's no, you know, TLC taking place at these schools. It's just our heart is all about the students and getting to know them. And then you sense that from a community college students. They, they just love their teachers because we spend so much time with them. As, as compared to you know, professors that are focused on teaching and, and going after the grants. So you can't have a land surveying program without the tools. That's our, that's our surveying um, supply room. It's getting packed. We just have too many levels, too many tripods, too many rods. We need more space. And so the NSF grant has allowed us to buy a lot of tools, but now we need the space. So sometimes you, you focus on a certain item on your grant and then you realize oh my goodness i forgot to include money for this part <laughs> and you won't realize until it's until it's too late so we're out of space we need to go after more real estate uh brandon royce uh this is him eating indian food with me he has never eaten indian food and so i um invite him over to go eat with me he just landed a job with a private company um every time he shows up to help me ta my class on thursday evening He's pretty uh, sleepy at times because they check in pretty early, around five or six in the morning. So, but that's what he wanted. Now he got it. So I love treating him to go out and eat. And so that's Brandon Royce. He just landed a, a job with a land surveying company. This is the California Land Surveyor Association Los Angeles chapter. That was the first face-to-face -face meeting after uh, things got better after COVID. So it was... Um, Awesome to see everyone together again. And again, I'm, I'm learning from everyone. And for us to be able to launch a program, I need everyone's help here. And some of them are students, some of them are licensed surveyors, some of them are techs, but I need the help from the whole community of practice and land surveying to be able to launch this program. It has been an amazing journey. Um, so, but again, half a million dollars is not enough. Uh, we need about a million. <laughs> And that was just three years worth of efforts. So it went by really fast. We're trying to go after another one. We're trying to work with other schools. I'm trying to work with Dr. Bach and see if I could get a letter of support from him as well on some future idea projects that I have for our, for our, for our school. So with that, I'll take any questions or do we have time for questions? A question or two, of course. Yes, sir. So not so much as a question as a comment as uh, um, gentleman up front said, um, I'm all for the four year degree, but uh, those of us who network realize that's not the issue. 
the issue is bodies on the ground. There's not enough talent. Yeah. I mean, there's not a big enough talent pool. And you can look up and down the state. I obviously work for Caltrans for a short period left. Um, there, I, I think I know right now of 40, 50 open positions yes. in surveys. And all the major um, companies have two, three, four open positions that they can't fill. The counties have open positions that they can't fill. And these are for boots on the ground to, to have a basic survey knowledge to get out there and do some surveying so that we can we can lift the profession up from the ground. Um, so what you're doing is really, really helpful, but whoever it was that told you um, there's a lot of money, it's six figures, don't put that, don't, don't dismiss that. Because right, the kids, right, of course. If the kids in these areas, um, such as East LA that are looking at, well, if I really work hard this next year, I can make 40 to 60,000. You tell them, you know, somebody can start you out at 80,000 and within five years, you can be making a hundred and a quarter. That's gonna, there's there's passion, but those that are passionate are, passionate are gonna have even more passion. It's gonna jump in, you know, be first and, yeah. and dive into it. So again, do what you're doing, but don't don't dismiss. We need those, yeah. you know, those youngers boots on the ground that only have their SITs or or looking to get their SITs. No, in fact, during my first day of the workshop, during my first day of class, I always teach them a, a quick budget analysis, how fast the money disappears after you pay federal state taxes, retirement. And I always tell them this one line item that I want you to focus is give it back. Just give it right back. You know, you get paid and just learn to, to give. And so I keep telling them, PLSA is really generous with their funds. They're always giving out scholarships, but I want them to just focus on that. It's gonna come if you work hard, but just learn to give it right back, right back to those future students. They're right, just right behind you, right? Those future students that have not taken land survey, they're gonna need some support as well. And so I, I don't dismiss it. I know it, it's there, um, but I try to focus on just giving it right back, right? Because the money's gonna come there and, and uh, we show them, I know all the salaries are online for DWP. I'm always showing them the salaries for DWP and they're always in shock. <laughs> yeah, they're always in shock how fruitful it is to work for agencies like DWP. But I want them to focus on just giving it right back Give it right back to society. Find something that you believe in and just give it right back. Any other questions? All right, there we go. Thank All you right, very thank much. You folks. Yeah, sorry. Um, also, just to let you know here, um, while we have about 35 um, present in person, we have about um, 87 joining virtually. So um, if you do have questions, it may be helpful to stand up because the OWL camera will actually can, can um, get your video and the audience um, virtually can also see your face. Um, I think they're feeling a little left out. So um, if you just please also be um, mindful of our virtual guests. Yes, ma'am. Well, yeah. All right, so our next presenter, Dr. Dana Kack. The MISC. Uh, the title of the presentation is Modernization and Harming of the NAB88 and Title Data Infrastructure at Scripps Oceanography. Uh, Dr. Dana is the NOAA National Geodetic Survey Pacific Southwest Regional Geodetic Advisor. He assists the geospatial community throughout California and Nevada, including public and private sector surveyors, GIS professionals, engineers, and earth scientists with the proper application of the NSRS system. Dana has been part of the NGS since 2014 and has degrees in earth sciences, geophysics, and geodesy, and currently resides in San Diego, California. The California Spatial Reference Center, located at Scripps Institute of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego, is hosting his position. Dana also holds the research associate position in the SIO Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics. So with that, I have a round of applause for Dr. Dana. So I um I thought I had more time, you know, with the presentation, and Maria cut me back to 15 minutes. So we're going to change the title to um, the tidal network and the I guess we'll say the um, passive control network for tidal and NABD88 that almost didn't happen, right? So we're going to share some secrets and tell a little story about 
what happened. And it all started with this. And you know, how would you title this picture, right? We call this a really bad day. And it turns out that these were two of the oldest benchmarks on scripts. And it was the tide gauge was tied to this going back to 1929. And I got a phone call from script management and said, oh, we're putting in this new coastal sciences building or coastal studies building right by the pier. We have two benchmarks, we want to reset them. We have them for you here at the office. <laughs> I said, you have them for me? Oh yes, yes, they were really dirty. We had the shop clean them up, but we had everything. <laughs> so I walked down there and I met with them and they were really nice about it. And I explained to them that once they've been removed that we cannot, we cannot reset them. And then I, they had this constipated look on their faces and very serious concern. And I said, let's see if all hope is lost at the moment. So this is, I was a little bit worried, but I wasn't totally panicked quite yet. My day got shattered. <laughs> so this is our website and the map. And, and in doing so, you can see here, it looks like we had plenty of NAD88 marks. The, the, it just by some chance, I had a screenshot of this from the email going back several years now. And it looked like we had plenty of passive control in this area right by the pier. And we thought, oh, we had some other passive control. And then there was this mark right by my office. And I knew that mark was there. So I thought, okay, we have you need we need to have six NAVD88 marks to tie this in. Well, the reality was is that things weren't looking so good. And then I found this one data sheet and it says down in here, if you have any questions about the GPS data on it, contact Dr. Bach. He's been around since 1991. And if you look at the bottom down here, there's a recovery note. And it says that there's been a lot of construction on campus. And now there's a building in the place where we think that this mark, so this mark is probably no longer there. But it had never been verified. So it turned out that a lot of these marks that you see on the screen were missing. Or I couldn't find them. So, so then I, I reached out to some of the NGS folks. And we can read that, right? So, so the bottom line is they say, oh, yeah. The tie gauge network, it's pretty common to lose seven marks in 10 years or so. And it's, you know, um, but there's plenty of marks around scripts. Don't worry about it too much. But the primary benchmark should still be attached. And it's right at the end of the pier and go look for it. And then this picture, the picture of the primary benchmark that the tie gauge was, was off. And I found this, and they were doing construction work on it. And the tie and the benchmark, the primary mark, it's literally right there on the bench, right above, uh, right above all the work they were doing. <laughs> This is where my nightmares, I started having palpitations that, you know, we're going to lose all the history of the Scripps tie gate networks and stuff. And I'm the NOAA guy on site. I let this happen, right? So I was getting really anxious at this point. So I reached out to several people at co-ops. And they said, oh, yeah, don't worry. There's lots of title benchmarks around there. So they sent me this map here. And, yes, I was able to verify all the um, title marks. But only three of them were any BD88 marks. And like I told you, I needed to have six of these. So, but there were some good things that happened. There was an opportunity. And, and the heroine in the story, she, she's not here, unfortunately, is Cammy Ingram. She's the facilities person. And she really, and she was the one that I think who actually called me. And it's, 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 I digress for a second. The last time I talked to Cammy prior to this was her calling me to tell me that a tree had fallen through my office. <laughs> And it, if you guys remember that, right? And you know, my office used to be up here in a temporary building and the tree fell over and the tree went through the roof and it broke my office chair. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, whenever Cammy tends to call me, that's not true anymore, but back then whenever she called me, it seemed to be bad news. And, and this helps with the story. So anyhow, moving along, Cammy took this seriously. And next thing you know, she had me in multitudes of meetings with the campus. And in doing so now, passive control is part of the campus plan. It has to go through um, uh, the landscaping committees, and there has to be a decadal plan for all the passive control on, on campus so that we don't have this situation again. And then they committed to actually paying to um, have the network recovered. So, hope it all, you know, I was feeling a little bit better. Okay, we're gonna try and do this, we're gonna work with the folks. And the surveyor who was actually doing the initial work, he felt like this was beyond his expertise, and they put out a contract. And Scripps put out a bid to people, and Jonathan Franks, unfortunately, to them. <laughs> um, and, and Alan's here to um, to make sure that I tell the truth um, and be my footnotes. Um, uh, took on the job, and he came in and he looked at the same map and he says, "Oh, 
there's plenty of benchmark around here. We should be able to do this. <laughs> and I said, I, I can't You're find right. that. <laughs> so I don't know if this is a direct quote, but it was certainly his intention, basically saying, you know, I don't think we can do what I was just hired to do. We got a problem. Um, and I said, yeah, nice to see you too, Alan. <laughs> so anyhow, if we start so the work begins, right? So, at, so this was, I don't remember what month it was, but I think this is probably February or, or March of 2020 at this point. Does it sound right? Something like that. Alan and I spent two months looking for benchmarks. And at one point, we were up there, um, we were up at the aquarium, actually. And um, he was, we we're both, our, our, our hearts were lost. There was no hope in getting this, this, this thing done. So I, I got this brainy idea. I'm going to call a friend of mine, Jeff Euler, who works for co-ops. And he says, he goes, I'm, I'm telling you, I know there's a benchmark someplace, you know, give me an hour to go that. So Alan says, all right, I got to go back up north. And, you know, I go home. And and I'm not even supposed to be down on campus with people because this is during COVID, right? The federal government had reassigned my office to home. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't allowed to leave without permission, essentially, right? So I, but I'd come down and we we're doing that. We, we were really desperate to get this done. And um, Jeff called me back and he said, hey, bud, I think I got it. I think I found the benchmark. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm at home now. And he goes, well, you need to go back there and do it because I can feel it in my bones. I think we know where it is. Okay. So I got in my truck because I couldn't be in official duty and I drove down here. And, and by the way, those of you who see my truck, it looks like something, well, my neighbors get upset when I park it in front of their house. <laughs> and give me an idea. So I got on campus and my boss, I called my boss and told him what I wanted to do. And he said, okay, as long as you don't do anything illegal, we're fine. I and mean, he was joking with me. But it turns out I, I got down on campus and, and I got to this place right up here, um, right at the right above the um, the fisheries. And there's a new road there with a gate on it. And there's a benchmark somewhere in this area. So I, you can actually see my truck is, is parked like right there. So my first visitor, I start, I start digging around and I got Jeff on FaceTime and I'm walking around. We got the rulers and we're trying to find this message and I got the shovels and picks and all that. And then a police officer walks up. He says, well, what are you doing? So I started explaining to him and all this, all this. And, um, and I'm like, you know, I got Jeff on there. And then Cammie Ingram shows up and, and he's like, oh, so she starts taking over and she goes, oh, he's doing really important work. And, you know, this is to get the, you know, the survey network for scripts and the time needs and all that. And she takes the police officer all the way. And then, um, so she deals with that. And then Cammy comes over and actually helps me dig it out. And we found the benchmark, right? And this benchmark was critical, wasn't it, Alan, that we found that one because we had already run some, some, some levels and we could not tie it in because of the distances. We needed to be, what is it? Four millimeters, the square root of the distance, right? Something like that. Cause it's first order leveling the whole way. And we had to go all the way to, um, uh, Gilman Drive to recover the network. So two miles, and everybody I talked to at the NGS is not used to elevation changes. And the first mile of this project is 400 feet of elevation change. It was some really difficult level. So, but anyhow, but, so after we got this taken care of, we started building the new monuments and putting the new monuments in. And is that playing online? A little bit, yeah. not too bad. Mm -hmm. So we got it in, and this is a really important one. This is at the director's house. And um, we we put in uh, in this in line with there, and then in total we added 12, 12 new benchmarks. It ended up being in the end. Originally it was going to be three, but I'd forgotten to mention that benchmark that was in front of my office that I knew was there. Alan went by, and in the month that I was at home with COVID, they had replaced that intersection and took out that benchmark. So we'd lost another NAVD eighty eight benchmark in the process of doing it. But anyway, we got past all that. The survey started. We started getting our, started going in, we ran out, we included the tide gauges and uh, put in the rest of the marks at the different entranceways. So in the end, we ended up getting them, we ended up putting in, you know, 12 new marks and reinforcing the, uh, the benchmarks. Some of the, um, th this website is still not entirely up to date. Um, I have to remove about 12 of them that we don't think are there anymore, but we managed to get 12 new ones into the network now, and we recovered everything all the way out to the tide gates with NAVD88 and the um, tidal network. We combined them. And, um, and then now, like I said, we're part of the scripts 
who were part of the Scripps um, decadal plan for maintenance of the project. And it turns out that they're actually building a new parking garage down by uh, El Paseo Way. So that part, that march is actually now being considered um, a reference for that project and a few others. So we're actually starting, and then if I remember correctly, um, you're, there's, um, there's about a hundred other points that were campus marks that are having to have the corner um, corner record corrected and they're in the wrong places. So now everything the network has actually spurred a lot of collaborations and a lot of um, different survey projects around that. And one of these was with a haphazard um, a counter um, that was going on in, in James and Paradigm Geospatial um, was uh, in charge of trying to integrate a new platform for the LIDAR system. So he's like, oh, do you have access to the pier and all that? And I said, sure, you know, let's go down there. So we so we decided to test out in all the challenging environments and have spot walk around the pier. And and this particular day, they uh, they just finished doing some dive tests. So there's some um, bodies, you know, laying around these like stuffed bodies laying on the pier and stuff. And we were walking all the way in there. And at one point, we just wore a spot out to where a spot couldn't move. And, and that's uh, Sean's over there too. And then... Um, Spots is dying. We're like, we can't move it. We have to move the tripod. Make sure that we scan where the dog is right there because we can get the whole the whole series. So anyway, so in doing so, they got really overly motivated. And with 500 setups, we scanned all of Scripps and SIO and, and the peers as a result of the network. So we brought this down, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but um, uh, I understand this is the 300th, was it? So it's about five millimeters accuracy yeah, relative between the different that. points. So then each each black dot represents one of the tripod setups that we did. And there's a benchmark right there. You can see it. Um, so the relative accuracy, more or less benchmark to benchmark, is about a, about a half a centimeter at this point in the vertical. And then we caught all the benchmarks. And then I... We also, the main reason we did this video initially was I wanted you to get a sense of the challenges that we had as we surveyed through this whole project and then going up to the height changes and so forth. So, and then this is where the, um, this, this benchmark right there is the primary one that, that was the old tie gauge one. So we got that one locked down really well right now. And then we have the old director's house. And then we go up to the entranceway of Naga Way and then head up toward the, uh, the fisheries. So, and then this is a, an intensity scan, right? It's the uh, yeah, intensity it's scan of the... Right. How's it going online? Is everybody able to see this? Yeah. Okay. That's cool. So this turned out, this little project of ours was, was like planning a wedding, you know? I mean, it takes years and it's very anticlimactic, but once, yeah. it, once you figure yeah. out it's gonna work, you know? <laughs> All the things that we... Yeah, if I ever do write a memoir, it's going to be theory and reality, what I think is going to happen and what will really happen in life, right? So anyhow, um, so we're getting close to the end here. But but yeah, so we, we go up to the last mark at the uh, entrance to biological grade. This, here's the bridge up here in my office. We tried to do a quick token look at the offices, the uh, CSRC, and then we continue up the road. So this is, like I said, there's 400 feet of elevation change from the from the uh, primary benchmark up to this mark right up here. So, and everybody that I had at NGS that I tried to get me to help with this project, they're really enthusiastic and all that, but they all live in flat places. Mm -hmm. So every time we had a problem, they weren't able to really help us, right? I mean, Alan, I think we talked to everybody at NGS, right? I mean, this project has had no less than 30 or 40 people involved in trying to get this recovered. And, mm -hmm. and at this point, we, we got everything tied back together and every, all, all the marks now are first order, Marks, some of them are first order, first class, some of them first order, second class. And I think that's the end of the video. We zoom out, you can see all the data that we collected on it. And then one of the other um, results of this <clears throat> was as, as I was working with James and Geo Prism and all that, we they decided they were going to go out to Black Beach and actually scan that project. So that actually facilitated some other contacts. I hooked up Yehuda, Mark Merrifield, everybody else. So they can actually do that, and they managed to actually scan Black Beach before the collapse and after. But I, I, I have to wonder if there's some nefarious activities there. It just seems too perfectly timed, like a day before, day after you guys got the project. Mm -hmm. 
We had the same luck at Beacons. It did Beacons. We had it the day before the bomb cyclone. Mm -hmm. And then immediately after the bomb cyclone. Mm -hmm. He knew he disaster just how much scans them. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to digress for a second and go back and talk about like what's in the name. You know, one of the challenges we had with the project that you wouldn't think that you normally have was what to name these new benchmarks, right? And then, and it's a unique opportunity, you know, but the thing was is that there were all these requirements. We had campus requirements, we had NGS requirements, and then the people that are involved, we didn't know what to do. So we decided there was an opportunity there. So I reached out to the, um, the CSRC Education and Recognition Committee and talked to them about how we're gonna do this. And that committee uh, at the time was myself, Greg Helmer, Marie Turnigan, uh, Kim Holt, Brian Bannister, who was really enthusiastic about this, Rob McMillan and Scott Martin. Who important, but Scott, the reason he's great, he wasn't there for the first meeting. So we had a lot of discussions about that. <clears throat> and, um, and, and, and we discussed the naming a lot. I mean, we discussed it a real lot for like days. <laughs> we, we could not get consensus of what we wanted to do. Brian, Brian felt like just naming benchmarks wasn't enough. We needed to rename continuous stations and start recognizing people and all that. And, and, and in doing so, um, we actually came up with um, some ideas. So we'll walk through it. So we had um, put some benchmarks down here. The first set down here at um, El Paseo Drive, we decided we were gonna name it after the first geodetic coordinators. Scott Martin mm -hmm. got the name on the very first one. And then um, the, uh, the random mark that ended up being a key place we felt was really influential. And that's um, right up there by the nod to wait entrance. That was um, Bill Young. He named that one after Bill Young, right? We felt like that was a really worthy one. And then the one at, um, then there was another one up at Biological Grade and I'm almost embarrassed to explain this one. <laughs> but uh, we, we Alan comes up and he says, oh, this one's not so deep. It's kind of shallow. And it's, I don't know if it's going to be that stable. So we didn't want to do that. So then Alan went behind my back and named it after me. So it ended up being probably the perfect one. But the thing was is that it broke all the rules because my last name is, is nine characters. So we had to do a bunch of stuff to do that. that and stuff. Then, <laughs> And lastly, um, the one at the old director's house, we, we named after Dr. Bach Ooh. for his uh, vision and so forth. So, so we're, we, we're going to do some recognition here. And um, I know that you've been eyeing the cheese board for a while. So uh, I, we went ahead and we made him a cheese board. And by the way, I don't know if you guys can see this, but we've been trying to give them this award. You can't see it, unfortunately. But we were trying to give them this award since April 2020. So this, this whole thing has been in the works now for three years and COVID has gotten in our way. So anyway, Dan, I know you've been busy with uh, with burning and, and uh, woodworking and digging right. holes around. But last I remember, we, did, we had a better program for this award. I mean, I know it was years ago, but I thought I thought we were going to to honor Dr. Bach in, in a much more significant way. Oh, yeah, no, no I'll throw that away. Dana's been uh, busy with a shovel more than just simply uncovering benchmarks <laughs> and collaborating with the staff here. Um, Steve Cammy uh, couldn't be here today, but uh, been instrumental in, in this whole program, and um, and Mario who helped. Uh, yeah, these guys got really really enthusiastic. But the star the star of putting this. Uh, Memorial together is is Mr. Cockamus here. I don't know. I, I think he didn't have his hair to begin with, but uh, he's pulled the rest of it out. And when he got done doing that, he'd call me in the evening and say, "I don't know if we're going to be able to get this done." Well, I think we talked about it a lot, <laughs> right? We had a lot. We have been talking and and drinking a lot too. We were drinking. Yeah. We all. I needed some anesthetics for sure. <laughs> so. They got busy with uh, with wheelbarrows and shovels and concrete. And I wore them guys out like spot. Yeah, that was. And a foundry. So in addition to uh, your charcuterie board, 
Please. I'll give it to her later. Yeah, you get to uh you get to uh chop um uh, you can have yeah. to get that top of cheese on top of uh, your and, and it is food safe. I use all food safe wax. It's perfect. <laughs> that's that's right out of Dana's workshop four years ago. <laughs> but this uh, we'll just here is a memorial of. Uh, can you put that on? In the family region out of Carson and Lindsay. That's a miniature of uh, what we're going to go out and uh, take a look at here shortly, uh, down next to uh, the benchmark that Alan and his crew put in for uh, Dr. Bach. It's going to be there in a very prominent location to uh, award and commemorate our founder of uh, CSRC. Yeah, send it to the script director. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. And it's it's not without a lot that's gone into getting us to this point and our founder doing so much for us. This is from 2001, the uh, um, com uh, commemoration of uh, the founding of CSRC with uh, uh, Charlie Charleston, who was director of NGS at the time. Um, a very youthful looking Yehuda Bach. <laughs> And uh, Bill Young, uh, who was the first chairman of CSRC, and uh, Charlie Kennel. Uh, Kennel was uh, director of scripts at the time. And I was thinking about this, and you know, you've heard this story about uh, um, starting CSRC here some twenty plus years ago at scripts, and and now you've seen some of the work that we've done leading up to uh, artificial intelligence and space geodesy and linear algebra and all the things we saw this morning and, and where this where this activity is going. It actually, CSRC started probably, I'll say 10 years before that, which was about 1990, 91, planning for the original HPGN survey. And uh, several of us, Bill Young was there, um, Larry Finsky, who uh, said maybe was he's traveling or he's got family in town today, so would not be able to be here with us. Um, uh, Don D'Onofrio, who was uh, Dana's counterpart at the time in the early 90s. Um, so we were meeting several times in um, Sacramento to plan for the HPGN survey, the original 1991-35. First, one of the first uh, high precision geodetic control networks in the nation. And we were all surveyors thinking, okay, well, Marks, how dense do they got to be? And how long do we need to be on station? And we just barely learned how to spell GPS at the time. Um, but Dr. Bach came to help us plan this out and brought science along with him. Um, really, no one knew what epic dates were in 1990. And that was really the beginning of it. And now it's it's across everywhere. Um, <clears throat> brought space geodesy with him and gave us the science backing to really build a network to start with. Soon thereafter was the commissioning of Pinion Flats, the first continuous site. Thank you for that all as well. And after that, began CSRC and the things that we were doing. Bill Young and I were going to uh, to uh, Washington, D.C. to uh, meet with Congress people to talk to them about why this was important and um, met with, uh, with the House Appropriations Committee and began to uh, build a consensus that, um, that there was a national need to fund geodesy. Pipe modernization came out of that uh, in North Carolina because it was the chairman of the appropriations committee at the time. And uh, here in California, because we had the science and the infrastructure behind us to, to try and do these kinds of things. And that, that built up uh, the center here for several years. And 
built up uh, another uh, parallel center in uh, Louisiana. So we were collaborating back and forth there. And all along, it was soon after that, the, the uh, continuous network started building up. They're growing rapidly. Yahoo's thinking out ahead of all of us. We're going, this is great. We've got all these active control points. We've got this database coordinates. We started processing our own data. Uh, CSRC and Scripps had uh, brought, another thing it brought to us that's now institutional is, well, there's this better framework, ITRF, a scientist, we're using a, a superior system. We, we've done our first adjustments on NAT83, which we know is completely inferior uh, today. He brought ITRF to us. We began doing our processing on ITRF. We brought that to NGS, who after the 2010 adjustments said, you know what, you're right. We probably should be adjusting on ITRF and transforming to NAT83. And now we're looking at the um, modernization of the National Spatial Reference System. And you saw some of the things this morning that are gonna add to that. How does that dynamic model actually work? And how is that gonna integrate into a national system where just like with Epic Dates, they didn't wanna hear from us in 1990. They didn't care. They said Kansas stays the same all the time. We don't care. <laughs> Most of our constituents don't care about this, but there's a whole group out here that does, has the interest to it. And we proved that when we got that type of fine resolution and precision into the national framework, people found applications that they needed that. We started looking at sea level rise. We started looking at uh, post-seismic motions. And we will do the same as now we're getting into vertical and, and other things. So there's a great future here for a lot of people that can carry this uh, infrastructure further. And it's in great, great thanks to uh, Dr. Bob. We are going to get a chance to uh, take a walk down to. Um, Can I say something? The uh, monument and have a look at it and get some. Yeah. Uh, we did have some more pictures that we can put up next to the. Uh, can, hey, this is. Can you guys hear? Can you guys hear me? Seconds, just some more. Uh, we hey. got. Um, we got a couple of people. A couple of people that want to say. Peter, um, Peter, were you going to say something? Mm -hmm. to oh. Say a few words. Uh, I'll, um, I'll try to keep uh, my voice up. So I can or just come up here if you don't mind, so the people online can see and so let it work better, please. And switch over. And, um, I have one question with my talk, Dave Mirtha. Yes, we did have the servicers on the tripod when we did the work. Was, everything was done, two specifications, two the line, no, no shortcuts. Okay, so you all know um, Yehuda from his work in um, um, supporting the center and what um, a great job he's done. But he also um, 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 has a day job, I guess, as it were here at uh, Scripps and IGPP, where he's also uh, excelled in these same uh, GNSS um, instruments that are used to define um, spatial references can also be used for um, uh, science and um, monitoring uh, uh, festival deformations related um, to plate tectonics and for studying signals related to um, Earthquake fault. And Yehuda has made many, many, many important um, scientific contributions to our field. For example, he's played a leading role in using so called high uh, uh, sample rate um, GPS to study large earthquakes in real time, where uh, GPS has the advantage that it um, stays on scale even for the um, largest earthquakes. So, should know that his work hasn't been um, limited to uh, California or even the United States. He's been involved in studies all over the world, like including um, deformation in Sumatra, Nepal, um, the Middle East. Got uh, hundreds of research papers that have received over uh, 20,000 citations. So 
you may well, I mean, you may um, know him here in the context of the center, but he's also um, very well known in uh, the geophysical community. He's been a great uh, uh, teacher and uh, a mentor to uh, our graduate students, um, postdocs over the years, and um, many of these have gone on to fulfill key um, positions in the institution. So um, congratulations, Yehuda. You've been um, a wonderful colleague here at IHPP, and we're very pleased that you received this recognition that you so uh, richly deserve. To say that we're also neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you think through your speaker. Wait, <laughs> or my speaker, one of us. How about mine? Yeah, yours, because you're the microphone, too. All right. You know what? I think we can't hear them. We can't hear them. Trying to see if we can get a remote speaker. Oh. No, hold on here. Are they are those are those on? I can do output in the help. Oh no. Yeah. Um, well, who do you have? Dave. Dave, do you want to try speaking? Yeah, can you hear me? There he is. Yeah, can can you hear me? <clears throat> oh. the, online oh, yeah. the online people can hear you, Dave. Oh, but can you Dana probably can't hear me. Uh, Dana can hear I can you. hear you. We, oh, you can, you can hear me? Yep. I'm not sure. So, all right. Dana, can you hear me? I can hear you, Dave. Sorry, I got you. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I just want to say a few words. Uh, first off, um, Yehuda, you look a lot older than... Uh, than when I first met you at Ohio State in 78. So we've been seen, known each other for over 45 years. And so I just, I wanna congratulate you. You deserve this award. Um, we really had a lot of great discussions. You were very instrumental in the height modernization program really being promoted. It was started by the North Carolina congressional people, but then California was also became part of it soon after that. But I really got to know you back when we were doing this height modernization. We had a lot of great discussions. Uh, some were louder than others, but uh, we always uh, came together in the end. Of, and I always learned something from you and I always ended up believing that we were going in the right direction and, and supported all your actions. You, Your support and your development of the the California Spatial Reference Center is really one to be emulated by some of the other spatial reference centers, and I know they've looked that way towards you. I've participated in a lot of the CSRC meetings in the past and really enjoyed all the discussions, and that was a lot due to all the work that uh, you and the others are doing, Yehuda. And, and even today, when I'm listening to the presentations, it's all great stuff that's going on, especially the geodesy program that you're starting to try to implement, which I really great of trying to advance geodesy and, and everything. So I just, I'm just happy to participate in this meeting. And as long as you guys continue to do these uh, virtually, I think I will, because I've got a lot of information that I've, I've learned uh, about, especially about the fill in the gaps. I might follow up with some of that, but Yehuda, I uh, appreciate all the work you've done for when back when I did work for National Genetic Survey and all of our discussions. I know you didn't sometimes appreciate how NOAA had to do their contracting and we had some great and fun and long discussions about those. But all in all, you've done a great thing for California and actually for the nation. So I applaud you for that and um, just want to say Congratulations for everything you've done and what you've accomplished. And I hope you continue to con to support Geodesy and Scripps and do many more great things. But uh, thank you.
Thank you, Dave. Would you mind standing with the podium with a few more people to speak? Just so they can see you. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Yeah, anybody else? <laughs> Bruce, would you want to say a few words? Uh, can he hear you though? Um, yeah, do that. Do that first again. You should be yeah, yeah. Just tell Bruce on this one. Oh, I, I, I just had a question for Dana. Um, when he was showing all those spots, all those benchmark spots, all the way back up to his house, and I was just curious. Was that density necessary or were you just doing that for fun? No, all the flat spots, spots represent where the um, uh, where we set up the uh, LiDAR tripods. So we couldn't scan within that area. And um, it was uh, part of a demonstration project and some of it was for fun too. Thank you. Anything else? Is that what we're trying here? Oh, okay, that might be a rare for the field trip then. Okay, so so by the way, um, Yehuda had a little inkling of what we had planned here. Um, Sharona um, basically said, you have to tell him at this point. We got away <laughs> with it, I think, for three years without even knowing what we were doing. So I'm not really sure if you had any inkling at all. <laughs> Go ahead. There appear to be a couple of hands up there. Okay, yes, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, this is Scott Martin. I just uh congratulations, Yehuda, a long time coven. Like like Dana said, we uh we started this pre-COVID. Uh we we're all ready to do it that spring, and then it got derailed. Um, and uh the two gentlemen standing next to you really kept it going. Uh and and as Greg said, uh, I, I too got those calls from Dana, um, where he was kind of like, "What are we going to do?" <laughs> uh, but but he uh, just kept us on the forefront, uh, made it a priority for it to happen today, um, and you know met with the grounds people to to work out what you're going to go see here in a minute, um, and uh, yeah, very very well deserved um i have to admit i had a little ptsd when i saw that picture from the dedication ceremony with you and bill because <clears throat> that was the first time i ever stepped foot on uh the campus there and my first meeting at uh csrc and marty ikahara was with me and all those chairs were set up and the podium and and i asked her what was going on and she asked me if i had my speech ready and i said what are you talking about she says, "Oh yeah, the, the media is going to be here. the The president of the college, you, you're you're being inducted into the California Spatial Reference Center today. It's a really big deal." And uh, those of you know Marty, she's very uh, straight faced, dry humor. And I was looking at that bluff and, and saying, "Should I just hurl myself off there right now? Because <laughs> I'm not prepared for this." And then she cracked a smile and said, "It has nothing to do do with you. They're dedicating the the center today." So. Um, it's been a I've learned an awful lot from you and and I think we've had a great partnership and and even a friendship over all these years and uh uh like Dave Z said we we hope we have you around for a lot longer so um take a walk with with the folks that are there and, and enjoy what's at the end of the uh the yellow brick road so to speak so and good great job Dana you really you really uh really Thanks. pulled it off that's all I got all right. So. Oh, wow, I'm. Uh, I am surprised. I was. I knew. I was notified on Tuesday. Dana was trying to call me. And I said, "Uh oh, what's what's going on?" Yeah, he called me back and said, "Well, well what do you want?" We threw a straw to Dana Boss. I remember that um, it was a meeting up in Sacramento, CSRC meeting. You remember 
uh, Scott, and uh, we were giving an award to Chris Walls, who's here. And I, I was presenting it to him and I, I joked, I said, I never get one of these. <laughs> So I don't know, maybe that's what uh no, no, this would go on. <laughs> but yeah, I want to thank everybody uh, for the, the kind words that Dave and Dana for uh for doing this. Greg has always been a, a colleague and a friend for I don't know how many years since the beginning. Something like 30 years now. 30 years. Um, yeah, it's really overwhelming. And I even got some kind words from Peter. That was her. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm very, uh, very pleased. Um, your support over the years, I went through a, a difficult period where I was, I was sick and everybody kind of supported me through that and I appreciated it. Um, yeah, I love to work with you guys and always, uh, you're challenging and, and fulfilling. I would say thank you to different people, but I, I there's so many people and I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, so yeah, but thank you very much for this, this honor and uh, look forward to working with you for many more years. Thank you. We're going to take a walk down to the old director's house and then come back for lunch and then reconvene by one o'clock. I, I, I know you're going to get down there, but Mar Marty does have her hand up. So I don't know if you have a minute for Marty. Maria's trying to hook her up now. <laughs> Hi. I just wanted to say congrats, and uh, it was a it was a the the re recognition was a long time in the waiting. But I don't want to stand between you and lunch. As always, congratulations, and it's been great. Thank you.